is this? I don't know. It's me. It's Amid the Ruins. It's a guy who makes dire wave music. <laughs> it's Amid the Ruins. Dire wave dire music. Wave. music. analysis is the implementation of the AI smart grid and the giant smart cities, which is what IBM talks about publicly building. And that's where we're going. And that's what I think we have to be really concerned about. So all of these tensions, they are part of a long-term strategy to basically get everybody moved into mega cities. Uh, they'll be forced to, they'll be forced off of land and so forth for environmental reasons and basically concocted and invented environmental nonsense uh, then you'll be stuck in some hellhole mega city in a you know basically a carton size apartment living over a target or something or inside of a target or a walmart as i said <laughs> several years ago it's actually coming true now there's actually target cities So, but to get there, you've got to have the constant clash, the constant um, alchemical blending and mixing and smashing together right out of Manichaeanism to produce the convergence, to produce the synthesis. And that's what's crucial in all this and what is absolutely true from an alchemical, esoteric, philosophical and geopolitical perspective, the fact that the ruling elite seek to be post-human jasonalysis.com can't try to 
fix today's problems politically. And this is what so many people in alt circles and alt right and alt whatever and alt media, they all seem to think that there's like a political solution to man's problems. And really the, the, the whole of modernity is built on this neo-pagan concept of right. political salvation. And there is no political salvation for man because man's problems are not essentially political. Uh, they're spiritual. Yes, I know the mic is on. Um, let's do this. How are y'all doing tonight? Where is everybody? Is it because it's a weeknight? What's the deal? Uh, is there anything going on? I never know if it's a holiday or a day it's Tuesday. Off. Tuesday, March something. Mm. I don't know. We're going to have fun though. When do we not? always do all right so uh, yeah a lot of people complaining <laughs> making fusses saying this is not a mafia movie scarface isn't a mafia movie. yes it is it's a remake of one of the classic mafia movies called scarface <laughs> so it is a mafia <laughs> movie even though it is not the sicilian mafia so what uh oliver stone did not want to do another sicilian mafia story so, uh, he and Brian De Palma cooked up the idea to update the movie to the time period of right, 80s Miami. 70s and 80s Miami. Push it to the limits. Make it lots of money. Push it to the limit. Limit. Making lots of money. Owning lots of flamingos. <laughs> Snorting lots of coke. Piles and piles of coke. Push it to the limit. Limit. South Park did a montage of that. Everybody does. Gotta so. have Everybody a does a, a push to the limit the, montage because it's classic. The one with the puppets. What was that one that I like? World Police. Um, Team America. Yeah. Team America did a push it to the limit, and that's all from Scarface. Yeah. And, uh, I watched a video on the making of Scarface, and they were laughing at the push it to the limits making money montage. <laughs> You got to stack cheese and stack piles of coke. Is, Push it to the limits. Is Scarface based on any real? I mean, I'm sure they just picked some person who was a uh, Cuban exile, right? The anti-Cuban exiles. And remember that this uh, relates to the, well, the story is, I mean, Scarface is Al Capone. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. But it's updated to be not a classic Italian gangster, but um, Cuban exiles. And of course, if you recall, Tony, I kill a communist for free. Hey, man, I kill a communist for free, man. Right, he will. I kill communists for fun. I kill communists for fun. Yeah. I kill a communist for fun. <laughs> because um, the mobsters hated what happened with Castro, supposedly, right? So. They had a deal with Batista, and the mafia, of course, went down and met with Batista. They were going to set up casinos and resorts. Momo was in on that. Mm -hmm. Multiple. Right? All the five families were in on this. And uh, when the Castro Revolution occurred, if you've watched Godfather 2, this is when Tony, excuse me, uh, uh, Michael Corleone has to flee uh, Cuba, right? Because the communists. Uh, are fighting the um, revolutionaries. I mean, the, the, the mobsters. They're going to kick the mobsters out because mobsters want to put casinos and resorts in. Anyway, uh, so in the case of Scarface, it's just another telling of a, a kind of a conglomeration of stories. And um, even though it is, again, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be Sicilian Mafia proper. So all the nerds who are being know-it-alls and telling, I know that this is about uh, a Cuban I know who Tony Montana is. We've been covering multiple books now, right? Um, Your shirt looks mops. Cuban. This is a Tony-inspired yeah. shirt. Yeah. And in fact, I'm going to put... I meant to put the jacket on. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, this is an Oliver Stone, Brian De Palma production. And um, definitely uh, one of the... the classics from Oliver Stone. Mm -hmm. I, I love Scarface. It's one of my favorite 
gangster movies. Not typical, well, but it's still, it's going to be in there. And we're not going to do every drug lord movie, every heist movie, every criminal gangster movie. This is just, I don't know, eight that we wanted to do. And we're not doing Godfather because I've already done Godfather three or four times. So we skipped Godfather. And there's some other, this is not the best. Okay, it's eight of the best because, mm-hmm. yes, there's Once Upon a Time in America. There's, um, we did Sopranos already. There's others that are not in this list. That's okay. We can't do them all. Mm-hmm. So these were the ones that were watchable. Uh, some I hadn't seen before. Some I had. Some were classics. Um, the Scarface stop is set in 80s, right? Or What you looking at me? What you looking at me? Huh? What you looking at me for? This is like Miami What do you think I'm going to do? What do you think I'm going to do here? Yeah. So yeah, I'm Tony tonight. I'm Tony Montana tonight. I'm not an Italian. I'm Tony. And uh, I'm going to say everything but his famous line. Okay, so you're not going to have to suffer through me saying... The little friend line? Say hello to my little friend. Uh. (laughs) I will say every line but say hello to my little friend. In his voice. Because I just said it, technically. So... There's all these refugees coming to Miami from Cuba. Yeah, this is interesting. This is uh, they said that this was a act- in the real story when all these refugees came from Castro's Cuba. Castro sent all the crooks. <laughs> uh, so we've heard of this before, right? So all the criminals come. The criminal elements well, show up yeah. in Miami, and that was on purpose. He flushed out all the jails, right, and sent them to the U.S. Uh, and that's even discussed in the movie, right? They talk about this in the first few minutes of the film and the opening sequences. Um, and it's also important to mention that the Cuban refugees, some of these people were uh, recruited by the CIA, paramilitary, uh, and they were involved in the Bay of Pigs. So there was a direct CIA involvement. And I wanted to mention again, now if you listen to part two, uh, then you know that we covered the CIA recruiting Sam Giancana. But there's also another figure uh, related to that, and that's John Rosselli, Handsome Johnny, who was um, an influential member of the Chicago outfit connected to Momo. He helped uh, organization control Hollywood and the Las Vegas Strip. In the early 1960s, he was recruited by the CIA as part of that plot to help supposedly assassinate Castro. Uh, And... This places Johnny Rosselli in many people's analysis as uh, one of the key figures in the JFK event. So we know that even the mainline histories will talk about the intimate connection between um, the JFK killing and Sam Giancana. And uh, Giancana claims to have supplied some of the people in that event. And John Rosselli is one of those characters. And Marilyn Monroe, too. Well, yeah, I got into all of that, all that juicy stuff. If you want to hear that, get a subscription and you can hear part two of the Mafia Talk for subscribers. So we just did lecture two for the free half yesterday. And then the part two of that will be tomorrow and that will cover um, the FBI, Vegas, uh, and JFK. Mm. So even the mainline histories, right? That's what's ironic is that even the mainline histories are... Uh, admitting a lot of this stuff that was, quote, conspiracy material, you know, 15, 20 years ago. What does this mean after the revolution? It's after the revolution in Cuba. Oh, okay. He was raised by Hollywood. Oh, right. Well, yeah, that's an interesting thing with um, Tony is that Tony Montana says that, I love the movies, man. I love your movies. Mm -hmm. I want to be like, you know, like a John Wayne, you know, like. (laughs) Like the movies, like a John James Bond, you know. Yeah. So he wants to imbibe and and become what is the American dream, and this is what is a theme in all these mafia movies of the immigrant who thinks that they can come to America, and their dreams will be made true. Right? They'll they'll find the American dream, and they end up losing everything because the American dream is kind of not <laughs> truly what it claims to be. Right? It's kind of a scam mm-hmm. because uh, you're really just serving mammon. Right? I'm not saying that everybody in America is evil. I'm not saying that everything about having a job or a small business is evil. It's just that a lot of the times it's sold to people that, you know, if you come here, uh, you're going to get rich and you just, you know, and it's 
it's sad, right? So he wants to be and live the American dream, which is the house, the cars, the girls, right? Mm-hmm. The power. The power, the money. <laughs> you get the power, you get the girls. Yeah. Yeah. He wants the power. Um, so there's a riot, the Cubans riot. Yeah, there's this riot that happens, and this leads to some um, Castro-connected people getting killed. Uh, and Tony, of course, has you know he he uh, there's a, a sequence that's mentioned in the movie that I had never noticed before, where the when he's being led into the country, one of the cops realizes that he's got a tattoo on his hand, which identifies him as a contract killer. So he's a hitman, and. Uh, he just blows it off like, oh, I, I, I do nothing. I do nothing, man. I do, I do, I did nothing. <laughs> I went to jail, you know, for stealing. I like how I stole some cigars or something. Man. I like how cavalier he is through the whole. No, I do nothing. No, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, the the funny scene when he hits on Michelle Pfeiffer that's pretty funny too. He's like, What'd you do? What'd yeah. you do? Yeah. She's like, She's dancing really. Wh- she's dancing really white, and she's like, <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> I don't talk to scumbags like you. Mm-hmm. Oh, Julia, like you ain't been with no man in a long time. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, how dare you? Julia, Julia, go. <laughs> He's got the cojones. He spits game. He's like, oh, Julia, go. Yeah. And, uh, like, yeah, he, he doesn't even care that she's the girlfriend of, like, you His know, boss. The, bo- the boss. Yeah. The you know, local gangster. Anyway. So. so, but it's also worth mentioning, too, that there is some, uh, some, relevant symbolism of the film in that the club where they all hang out is club babylon right mm. is america babylon is is america the offering of babylon to the um you know economically ravaged third world or immigrant populations that oh if you come here you'll you'll you know make all your dreams come true but is that really just the pro, uh, promise and offer of babylon right mm-hmm. what's the name of the hunky guy his friend that he's always with do you remember i don't remember his name mario no I don't know, Raul? no the guy that he i know he who you're talking about yeah yeah because he dates tony's sister yeah you yeah. touch my sister you touch my sister <laughs> i forget his name yeah raul something like that mickey mario <laughs> no mickey no it was something romantic anyway. they'll remember in the chat so yeah remember but what was his name Nobody remembers. Anyway, um, so we want to mention yeah Club Babylon and then what's next? Manolo, that's it. Manolo. Oh, Manolo. Yeah. Money. Yeah. So it was kind of Shakespearean in a way, the way it, it ended up with his best friend marrying his sister and he kills him out of. Bridge. Yeah, I'm I'm sure. Yeah, that's a good point. I bet I'm sure Oliver Stone did draw from Shakespearean. Mm-hmm storytelling you marry my sister like you he, my sister, he really bro? hated that yeah. um, you, you put your hand on my sister yeah <laughs> and one thing i didn't notice until this time was manolo mani yeah. yeah uh was they almost imply that tony has such a power complex that it's almost like he had a thing for his sister it is it's because at the end when she comes in, she's like, is this what you want? Remember? You want these? Yeah. You want me, Tony? You want these? And you want that? And you want these? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, but I never, I didn't remember that. It had been several years since I watched Scarface. So a lot of the, the elements I'd forgotten didn't remember. But yeah. Mm. So the, the geopolitical stuff that's real is relevant and uh, interesting. The... Um, symbolism is there uh, at, a, at a mild degree it's not a lot of symbolism but just the, the whole aesthetic of the movie is fascinating the colors that are that, that are used in club babylon uh, the aesthetic of just the garish decor of tony's house is every amazing. time i love it he sees the bathtub he's like i need that i bathtub. need a giant bathtub yeah. in the middle of the carpet <laughs> it's <laughs> like the size of a small child's pool <laughs> <laughs> like rubber duckies and you know like Foam everywhere. Yeah. So he he gets everything. He gets everything he ever wanted is the moral of the story. Yeah. He right? beats the other gangster. The money, he the becomes power, the boss. The, yeah. yeah, the girl, the white, but everything is just crumbles because why? It was false. Because, yeah, it was uh, a lie. Yeah. Right. Like, and he lost the only, the two good things in his life, which are Manny, Manolo, and his sister. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And that, I mean, that's the theme of the Godfather too. Is that, it's supposed to be for you know your family, for your tradition, your heritage, your lineage, and he loses everything in the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, Michael Corleone doesn't have any offspring. Well, he has offspring, but I don't think the guy is. Yeah. I mean, we. It's hinted that he's not going to be the heir apparent. So. How gaudy is his foyer where they have the final climax? That's what I was talking yeah. about. The interior decor is just so garish and over the top. It's wild. And he, they have that golden His office globe is all black. Golden globe that says something like the world is your... What was his motto? The world is mine. Yeah. The world is mine. <laughs> I want it all. Mm-hmm. Who says that? Lisa. <laughs> Lisa, tell me bye. Lisa, tell me bye. <laughs> yes, Tony uh, definitely has Lisa's... <laughs> Um, greed, right? yeah. greedy gut. Yeah. I want it all. Mm-hmm. If you've seen the room. Okay, so where are we at with the? Uh... I can't read your writing. I have to say. So this gets into uh, the cocaine drug trade. Obviously, that's big in right the south tip of Florida, Miami. I think everybody knows this. A lot of Miami money, right? Mm-hmm. The drug trade. Uh, I don't know all the dynamics of that, but uh, I was just uh, told that there's a really interesting movie that gets into this uh, with John Travolta. I'm not, I'm not a John Travolta fan, but uh, there's some movie that came out with him about speedboats and how the whole speedboat thing in Miami is connected to the mafia, and you could see why speedboats would be useful for drugs, right? Uh, I forget the name of that movie, but that's on my list of mafia-connected movies to watch. And then there's the High Ally. People were correcting me for I, I didn't know to pronounce it. Jai. It's not Jai Ally. It's High Ally. That stupid fake sport. Also a Florida-based mafia front. So you know, Florida is a big locale for this stuff. And um, yeah, I, I would venture to. Although I don't have any figures, I don't have any stats for you. I would venture to say that a lot of Florida's economy has been propped up by the drug trade. I mean, a lot of the U.S. economy has been propped up by the drug trade, all the way back to, you know, Sicilian Mafia, as we've been covering in this series, and even up into the 80s with Iran-Contra, right? Drugs and theme parks. They go well together. Yeah. (laughs) It's like Pleasure Island. Theme parks are a kind of drug. Remember Pleasure Island from Mm -hmm. Pinocchio? Didn't Disney used to have Pleasure Island? Yeah. Is that what they called the one for the adults? Yeah. I don't have that anymore. Now it's Harry Potter world, isn't it? Seriously. All that. I think it's yeah. Harry Potter world. Go ahead. Where are we at? Something. Drug Lord Basics. <laughs> he's like a basic bitch drug lord. Like he's got the white. Mm-hmm. He's got the well, hat. All, all drug he's got the, the cool Ray Bans. Want to emulate him because he's the coolest because he cares the least. He's the most flippant. I wonder who started the drug lord aesthetic, though, right? Like, uh, who's the guy with the Panama Jack, the monocle, right? Monopoly Man? No. Oh, Panama Jack. It's not the Monopoly Man. <laughs> <laughs> You've never seen 80s Panama Jack no. clothes? Yes, you have. Mm-hmm. Everybody has seen that. He has a monocle. You just who, really made me mad. Who, who, <laughs> who did the drug lord aesthetic first? Oh, okay, so let me find it's like the a logo. cigar. No, that. Okay. You've never seen that. No. They're like staple eighties clothes. Who I has heard. not seen Panama Jack? I, I mean, this is yes, you have. <laughs> I insist that you have. <laughs> it's from the eighties. It was all okay. It was in California. Okay. It still exists. You can buy those clothes still. Anyway. Drug Lord Chic. That's what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Maybe Al Capone. You also gotta have a you gotta have a big long fingernail, pinky nail, to poke the cocaine thing so that Ew. you can go. Yeah. That's good. That's good stuff. Well, we'll that be. That is good. We'll be getting, That's pure. Ew. We'll be getting what? Into what are you talking about? Another here? movie. Um, how Al Capone really loves his clothes and his look and his. Lavish lifestyle. Untouchables? All right, we got to keep going. We're, we're, okay. This is taking forever. Uh, oh, now, uh, Scarface was uh, controversial for its time, and actually critics didn't like it. They have reappraised it. Of course, it's a classic, obviously. But 
the uh, weird kind of montage scene seemed out of place, and it was almost like a music video in the middle of the movie. Push it to the limits. <laughs> yeah. And the uh, chainsaw scene, Brian De Palma had to keep uh, altering the chainsaw scene because it was too gruesome. It is pretty gruesome, but you know, when Tony makes his first deal in that skanky hotel, uh, right? The guys he's making a deal with try to cut him with a chainsaw. And they don't cut Tony, but they cut his friend. And uh, that all had to be uh, cut down for the MPAA ratings. What does this say? Mickey movies? I don't know what that means. Um, his mom was a pill. She wasn't very nice. But I guess she knew in the end what kind of person he was, right? She was well, like, she wasn't. Oh. No, she was, she's the moral backbone. She is oh, a good yeah. person. So she's, you know, just a simple Catholic uh, mom immigrant who lives in poverty and Tony's not having it right he wants to show that I, I'm gonna show you I can do something you know, I can become I can become B right and she's not having anything to do with it. he comes home after not seeing them in seven years and tries to pay her you know rent give her a thousand dollars she's I don't want your money take your dirty money <laughs> right yeah and the sister's like mama he's Tony <laughs> remember yeah and uh, so she's not impressed. So she represents the moral backbone, right? The 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 traditional Catholic mom who mm-hmm. doesn't want anything to do with his blood money. Mm-hmm. And um, Tony, of course, gets wrapped up in bigger and bigger deals, as is always the case in mafia movies. And he goes to meet with that Colombian drug lord guy. And mm-hmm. the Colombian drug lord guy is a whole other tier, right? He's got a giant freaking palace out in the middle of where Colombia. I don't know, but. Uh, and he's connected to people on the international level, right? So he's connected to generals and corporate uh, elites. And so we find out that the scale of these drug operations is massive, right? It's international. It's gigantic. Uh, right away, we can see, well, now you know why the drug war never ends is because the establishment at the highest levels runs the drug war. Duh. Hello. <laughs> Newsflash. Um, and this has gone on for a long time, right? All the way back, not just to Iran Contra, but back to what we've seen with the mafia lectures to, um, the establishment being involved from the get go. Uh, so, uh, the illegality, right? Just like with prohibition, the illegality, it works to the advantage of the system and the elites who run the networks. Now I'm not saying that means that therefore every single drug ought to be, in some libertarian way, promoted and free, oh, I get whatever drugs I want, man. Um, I'm not saying that's the solution. I don't have a solution because it's a very complex problem. But what I'm trying to say is that this demonstrates to us that the war on drugs is a scam. The war on drugs, just like prohibition, operates to the advantage of those that control the black markets. Mm-hmm. And when things are on the black market, the price is over here, dude. You see? So uh, that's actually in a way demonstrated in Scarface. And you, if you pay attention, you see that with how just kind of like Bill Harford, right? If, if you remember in Eyes Wide Shut, he gets wrapped up in people way above him, right? And that's a dangerous thing. <laughs> so Tony, this kind of small time gangster, thinks he's going to be a big, big time player. And he doesn't even realize that this is an international operation way bigger than him. Mm-hmm. And he's getting in over his head. And he realizes that in order to go to that next level, and of course, Alex always makes a good point about this. He references this film for this point, right? Uh, all the time is that at that level, like you got to be willing to, you know, go after women and children and do worse, right? And this is what Tony realizes that if he's going to work with, with uh, the big Colombian guy and the, the elites, the real elites, this is going to require like, you know, B O M B I N G, you know, kids, families, wives. It? I don't need that in my life. I don't need that in my life. Yeah. Do you think I want that on my on me, man? Yeah. Do you think I want that on me? <laughs> I don't need that in my life. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> so Tony, of course, kills the hitman that uh, the drug lord sends with him, who is obviously some kind of con- contract a psycho who gets off on bombing people, right? And that's relevant, again, because it shows you that at the higher level, right, it's not just about being a local Miami drug lord. It's it's serious business. And that's what really goes on. Uh, and that's what we see in, right, a lot of the 
mob stuff that we've covered in my lectures is that when we look at something like Murder, Inc., Right, uh, contract guilds of contract assassins and killers. Right, people using contract killers, assassins, people using contract killer and assassin like JFK stuff. Right, the mafia. Exactly. You see how this it all ties in. That's how the world really works. Uh, so anyway, Scarface is one of my favorites. It's a it's a great. Um, I like. Reviewing these, I um, actually liked Scarface, Casino, and Bugsy are some of my favorites. Donnie Brasco is, is decent. It's okay. Um, Untouchables, I did not care for it. It was goofy. Cheese ball. Let's talk about that one. Uh, we'll talk about that because this is it's just silly. Okay. I mean, I was ex- I didn't remember this because I, you know, I watched it when I was a kid when it came out, 87. Another Brian De Palma film. And I was thinking this was going to be, you know, like a... Scarface type of movie or a Goodfellas type of movie. No, this is like the goody goodies, right? The the this is the a, goobers, it's right? It's like if Ooh. Disney wrote a mob movie or we're gonna take care of all the alcohol. <laughs> we're gonna shut down all the drinkings because they're bad peoples. It's like the most goody goody Baptist wasp, really waspy teetotalers. Okay, so this is nineteen thirty, and they're they're a bumbling band of goobers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 1930 Chicago. <laughs> Go, going right? after Al Capone. <laughs> so, this made me question Prohibition because this went on from 1920 to 1933, mm-hmm. right? And I guess it came out of the temperance movement. Right, which the Rockefeller And there funded. was already some states wanting to be dry states, and they were against the saloon culture of the jazz age. <laughs> um, and they were against hedonism crime. And all of that that revolves around the bar and liquor and going out at night, right? So they thought that this would eliminate all of the dens of iniquity. Yeah, it's really kind of just um, naive and silly. I remember reading about the temperance movement and that it was actually part of social engineering and the Rockefellers were very heavily involved in it. And this will play into Hot Springs uh, and, and why the Rockefellers were so... Uh, ad- hot to shut things down with the mafia while at the same time being, you know, basically one of the biggest mafias, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like mafias versus mafias. And we'll get, when we get into the uh, Ashman book, CIA Mafia Link, of course that second chapter is Rockefeller Commission. So we'll be getting into that. But uh, this ties into Prohibition because the Rockefellers are a big, a big part of that. But they're really just using goody goodies. That's Mm -hmm. what, what's going on here. It's not that... Because everybody drank. This was so silly. Yeah, they found that... All the people would go drink. It just preyed on the poor, and it boosted organized crime, and Mm -hmm. then... But the one good thing that came was after Prohibition, when all the bars were closed, the men tended to stay home and drink with their wives, and women started (laughs) drinking more, and so they would just have cocktail parties instead of go to the saloon, so... Um... So you got Robert De Niro, who's... Well, imagine being an Italian immigrant coming over here and, like... Nobody, they're, they're out, liquor's outlawed, but you come from a, the country that's most famous for wine, <laughs> like it's yeah. right? I yeah. mean, it's like, what? So, you know, the, all the gangsters are like, it's a, like, gold mine, come over. Mm-hmm. But everybody's a hypocrite, though. So you got Robert De Niro, who's Al Capone, and the contrast between the Al Capone character and the Elliot Ness, Kevin Costner character, couldn't have been more cheeseball. Because you've got Al Capone, he's being served breakfast in bed in his palatial mansion, making money off of crime, right? And doing his out face. Can you do the thing? And then you've got Kevin Costner, and he's got like this plain but beautiful. Kevin Wa- Waspner. He's <laughs> he, like the ultimate <laughs> waspy he, dude. He's got this modest little clean house, and like his wife is plain but beautiful, and she's pregnant, and it's very like Christian, and you know. Yeah, he's a hyper moral uh, goody goody. But of course, mm-hmm. as we progress through the film, we we realize the absurdity of this is that, like the you know they're in all these shootouts. There's this you know Miss Tommy guns going off and like raiding bootleggers with horseback you know shootouts. And it's like by the end of the film, after all these people getting shot, it's like. <laughs> Sean Connery just opens up a, a, a cabinet and pours himself a giant glass of whiskey before he gets gunned down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I might as well drink. It was so crazy it's because... time for a drink. The, the so first... he's been out shooting 
bootleggers and he gets home and he's like time for a drink yeah it's it's preposterous I mean, but maybe that was the point of the movie it's just that it doesn't come off that way the movie just comes off very cheesy goobers they're all goobers and the, the whole team the team doesn't even make sense kevin costner is the only one with any sense and then he recruits this old coot <laughs> sean connery who's a beat cop and an irs guy and they go out <laughs> to, sh- to shoot down the monsters. It's, it's just... really stupid. So, um, the one of the first scenes is this terror bombing of a bar. And it makes you think of... Yeah. Um, um, and a little girl got killed. And so, they're pointing out that if you go against the law, then you're as bad as a guy who would walk in and do that to a place. It was just a weird It's morality. a weird morality, it yeah. is. Well, the whole period's morality is absurd. Mm-hmm. I mean, Jesus turns water into wine, and these goober Baptist Protestants think it's grape juice. I mean, it's just but like, come on. Kevin Costner, he loves the law, and he wants all the cops to stop drinking because they don't want to enforce this because it's stupid, right? So he's got to go in there and be Goody McGooderson. Mm-hmm. And then you've got the annoying reporter who needs his scoop. Remember that guy? Oh, yeah. That he guy. he <laughs> always yeah. needs, like, the scoop. Um, and, and then you've got him busting through that wall in his, like, mega weapon that they rigged up. Do you yeah, know and scene? it was all uh, plastic It was, like, umbrellas. Chinese umbrellas from plastic Canada umbrellas. or something like yeah. that. Yeah, so he, he kept failing, and then he figured out he needed to talk to a beat cop because mm-hmm. the beat cops know they got the intel on where the booze is. And mm-hmm. so Sean Connery takes him to the post office, and then they make their first bus there. Again, this movie is, is cheesy. I, I don't... Well, then you got your government nerd who came down and was like, hey, well, the IRS every five minutes, like, hey, we can get him for tax evasion. Hey, yeah. did you know and Kevin Costner because wants to be like, no, I need to find him. They want to get him for something serious, right? Yeah. And, uh, that, of course, ends up being, as everybody knows, what they got Al Capone for. Mm-hmm. What you got? They say Chicago has dirty cops in the force helping the mobs, like always. Because Sean is very, like, trust no one to Kevin Costner. He's like, oh, I forgot that older, part. You know, he's like, don't trust anybody on the inside. You That's know? a pretty good Sean Just, Connery but, you're doing there. <laughs> yeah, thanks. That's the best female Sean Connery ever. <laughs> he can't trust anyone. Right? I would forgotten that part. And then they, they go and they recruit Andy Garcia. Oh, yeah. Because he wants to be because a he, cop. Yeah, he's not a cop yet. So he's um, trustworthy. He hasn't, I see, he hasn't right. been corrupted by them yet. Yeah, and then he, of course, everybody, half of them get gunned down except for... Uh, so. For Kevin Costner or Kevin Waspner, as we'll call this him in this movie. This is the Motley Crew that is against the most famous. Yeah, this gangster. bumbling Motley Crew against like you know, three hundred wise guys, mm-hmm. right? I mean, the Chicago outfit had like three hundred guys. I just I thought they they were kind of harsh on Al Capone. I don't know if he really was a psycho killer, but in one scene, he like remember the baseball bat scene with the dinner. And he's like, uh, yeah, the I don't know. Like, I don't you know, know if that's, team I don't know if that was and, real or not. I mean, I don't doubt that Al Capone. Well, Al Capone was a, a bouncer, so he started out just as like a bouncer. So he probably beat some dudes up. But uh, you know, they typically wouldn't. They would just have somebody else kill. They didn't do the killing themselves. Right. So okay. I don't know about the baseball with that scene. If that was based on anything real or not, could be. Meanwhile, goody Kevin Costner won't even take a bribe. Oh yeah, the, the the guy tries to bribe him, and then he's like, "Get, get your butt out of here." One the the climactic action scene was the border raid of Canada with the Canadian Mounties, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it went on for way too long. I thought. Um, yeah, just really cheesy, and everybody remembers the baby buggy scene at the end of the shootout in the train station, and yeah. even that was anti. Climactic. It was like kind of a letdown. Um, Prohibition. They called it the noble experiment. Well, it probably was a social engineering mm-hmm. experiment. I mean, we know the Rockefellers were funding a lot of social engineering stuff at this time, such as the Orson Welles radio broadcast. That was actually a Rockefeller-funded uh, uh, social engineering experiment. And so it's not a leap to think that they were experimenting with 
you know, this mm -hmm. social with the prohibition. So then you've got, they find out that their cops are in the ledger book or something from this raid in Canada and Sean Connery. Well, of course, yeah. I mean, everybody, the, they do the, because everybody went to the speakeasies mm -hmm. and drank. Of course they were bought off. And they do the good it's cop, ridiculous. bad cop, Sean Connery and... see yeah so you mentioned that sean connery's drinking <laughs> yeah the that's game. the thing it's like we're shooting up everybody and then we're also drinking it's just yeah. it's all preposterous he got the tommy gun death right it, yeah, he did. <laughs> yeah he gets like yeah. 80 bullets and he's still crawling around and talking to mm -hmm. kevin waspner he's like, oh, i need a drink <laughs> I need a clear whiskey. Yeah. And then the baby buggy, your favorite scene. And then the creepy Elon Musk looking gangster man had to get, oh, he had to get a jail, get out of jail free card from the mayor. I forgot this part. Yeah. Was he a hitman? <clears throat> he was just one of the goons, like the creepy goons. Okay. That had a couple lines. So that proved that the higher ups were friends with these people. Of course. Yeah. Right. I mean, Al Capone, yeah, would make friends with the well, government guys and that was how this worked so he's the one that ends up making a scene at the trial at the very end and kevin costner threw him off a building because he insulted sean connery when he died mm. and so by the end kevin costner has kind of crossed the line from, oh he's from justice i see to, he's no longer you know, a goody goody yeah he's so. Got an edge. He's an edge lord. <laughs> yes. He's an edge lord yes. now. And what's the last line of the film? Um, when the reporter guy was like, "What are you gonna do now? The prohibition is ended." He's like, "What?" Well, someone have a drink. You think I'll? You think I'll have a drink? Think I'll yeah. have a drink. Yeah. And he like throws his jacket over. His, it's really dumb. So preposterous. Like all of this is just idiotic. But I guess you know if we look at things happening today, <laughs> we people are just as idiotic, right? So. <laughs> So that was Untouchables, 1987, kind of a... Another Brian De Palma. Mm -hmm. So definitely Scarface is better than Untouchables, easily. Yeah. But... Now what are you going to do? Uh, well, we wanted to do... Um, we wanted to save a couple of the big ones for the part two. So Cotton the... Club or Departed? Uh, Cotton Club is not that good. So we'll put um, uh, Departed and Goodfellas in part two. We'll do Cotton Club and Donnie Brasco. Well, no, we'll do Cotton Club and Casino, and then we'll save those. There's two big, two two big ones in that okay. for part two. So we'll let's do Cotton Club because that actually touches on. Um, and by the way, we got to mention Bugsy too. So um, yes, remember I did say the Warren Beatty Bugsy. So I'm going to be going from memory here because I forgot my notes. But this was a lot better than I expected. Uh, this is this is up there in my my uh, some of my favorite. Uh, mafia movies and uh he, this is the story as we said of bugsy siegel who was a uh very savvy organizational man right we covered this in last night's um installment and he and meyer lansky together had the idea for vegas right they had this idea that while we're doing all this you know underground gambling why don't we just have an area where it's legal and it will be like a utopia in the desert right and as we saw with Bugsy, and all of what I read and studied about Bugsy was pretty true to what's in the film, as far as I could tell. Uh, so he gets the idea for this Flamenco Casino. It ends up costing, like, he says initially $1 million. And so the mafia puts the union members' pensions into this. This is crazy. And so this is, again, hearkening back to how they control the unions, and you control quite a bit if you can control unions, right? Well, all this money goes missing, and... Bugsy says, oh, I need more, right? So he ends up three, four, five million or so crazy amounts in, you know, forties or whatever it is. Uh, and they finally get the Flamingo built and it's a disastrous failure, right? Brings in no money the first year. And so Bugsy is on the hook for millions of dollars. And as you can imagine, this doesn't go well for Bugsy. So he ends up gunned down. There's a lot of speculation as to who ordered that hit. Right, which of the Dons, but essentially the, the five families had that done uh, because uh, Bugsy lost so many millions of dollars and couldn't pay it back. 
There's also speculation, which comes up in the movie, that his girlfriend, Virginia Woolf, may have secreted away uh, some of those millions. Now, again, um, really good movie. I highly recommend Bugsy. Uh, It hits on all levels. It's a good story. Uh, And he's just an interesting character. He's not a full-on, obviously because he's Jewish, he's not Sicilian Mafia, but he is the point man for the five families in L.A. So he goes to L.A. and he does a lot of control of the studio system through the uh, producer, the studio union. So he controls the studio unions, makes decisions about who gets what role, and came really close himself to being in movies. So we would have had a full-on <laughs> mobster in the movies. Like Christopher. Yeah, right. But he, he doesn't end up doing Yeah, that's hinted at, at in the last couple seasons of Sopranos, right, where Christopher wants to be uh, you know, in movies. He doesn't end up in the movie, but he ends up with Carmine, um, creating that crappy uh, movie and Alec Baldwin plays uh, Tony Soprano, right? Or one of the Baldwins, maybe not Alec Baldwin. Some, one of the Baldwins plays Tony Soprano. Yeah, it's funny, right? Because it's a zombie meat cleaver. <laughs> Remember? Mm-hmm. Resurrected <laughs> mobster who kills the Tony character. Anyway, uh, so yeah, so I, I, I highly recommend Bugsy if you're looking for um, a top tier pretty true to history as far as I could tell from the research um, movie and then ironically within a couple decades the whole mafia arena of Vegas brought in billions so Bugsy was ahead of the time ahead of his time right so if he had just kind of waited around a few more years he would have actually seen uh, a huge return on his initial one to three million dollar investment because the flamenco alone makes billions of dollars uh, over the next several decades. But uh, anyway, so that's that. Um, can't think of anything else really relevant to Bugsy for our story, but uh, highly recommend that movie. Cotton Club. This one, eh, not that good of a movie. Somebody said the other day, almost a musical, right? I feel like I don't care about tab dancing and the. They've got me watching half the third of the movie is tap dancing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Who cares? <laughs> I don't oh. watch a gangster movie, not tap dancing. This is a... No, it's not a bad movie, but it's just not that good. It's a mediocre it, movie. Yeah. But it does feature a young Nick Cage going into Crage. He did have good Crage. Yeah, I, but I also expected... I was hoping for more of a... I mean, Nick has a minor role. This is Harlem 1928. And of course, the Cotton Club is a famous, you know, thing. It does tie directly into the to the mafia because the founder of Hot Springs, in, in the sense of the criminal underworld mob in Hot Springs, Oni Madden, is played by Bob Hoskins in this, and Oni Madden owned the Cotton Club, and so he actually dated uh, Mae West and another Hollywood figure. I forget who, but so this is even at this '30s '40s time, you know, you've got a direct connect between. Um, the mafia, the mob, the gangs, and Hollywood. Uh, of course, Oni Madden was a British gangster. So he was UK, wasn't Sicilian mafia. Um, but he, he did organize Hot Springs into a neutral area for um, the mafia to come and have meetings and sit downs. And you could understand why, because of the hot springs, the baths. You can't bring uh, a wire or a gun into a bath. This had that cool gangster trumpet music. Like that's the only that was the only music in the 30s. Yeah, (laughs) there was no other instrument except that (laughs) trumpet. 30s horn. Well, he plays the cornet, and his name is ridiculous. Buddy Dwyer, no, No, Dixie Dwyer. Dixie Dwyer. Yeah. So Richard Gere is the lead boring character. (laughs) Is Dixie Dwyer? (laughs) Yeah. And he is supposed to be based on the actor George Raft, uh, which. Somebody was calling me out because I supposedly said, I did not say, I didn't mean to say George Raft was a mobster. I know he was an actor. But the Dixie Dwyer character is based on George Raft, the entertainer actor character who gets in with Dutch Schultz and the mobsters. Mm -hmm. So Dixie gets a piano gig at Dutch Schultz's party. Mm -hmm. That's how they. Yeah, so he ends up uh, connected to this uh, psycho guy who will end up. Related to Albert Anastasia and Murder, Inc. Yeah, I like how he just stabbed a guy in the neck at the buffet. And Richard Gere's like, yeah, I'll work for you. <laughs> I got no problem with that. 
And of course, that doesn't go well for Dutch Schultz, right? So Dutch Schultz was a, not Dutch, but uh, a um, lower level Jewish mobster who ended up converting to Catholicism to try to better fit in with the Sicilian Mafia and ended up being such a kind of a loose cannon psycho that uh, it didn't go well for Dutch Schultz. He ended up um, taken care of. And in the movie, in Cotton Club movie, uh, it's Lucky Luciano who shows up at the Cotton Club and says... uh, who was kind of the head of the mafia right at this time, mm-hmm. uh, says time to get rid of, uh, of uh, Dutch Schultz. So Oni backs a lot of Broadway shows. I that was another I thing I forgot. Yeah, Oni, Oni Madden, the Bob Hoskins character, was also connected on the East Coast and was backing and funding a lot of the Broadway shows. I forgot about that. Uh, but he's the guy that dates Mae West, uh, and, and his headquarters, ironically, was just this unassuming little house outside hot springs so if you do the gangster tour or the mob tour in hot springs they'll show you all that <laughs> and he's just got this like regular normie middle class house so like the biggest mobster and like you know one of the biggest mobsters in that time period of the 30s 40s uh just has some little country house out in hot springs mm-hmm. the acts in this movie are like music videos a little bit that was a little bit enjoyable. Well, you it like made, you like musicals. I, I'm not a, long, I'm not a fan of musicals, so I don't. But I didn't like the music. I don't um, care for musicals. So. Oh, so this is kind of dumb. This is they do this a lot. The Dutch hires Dixie to look after his girl. The boss trusts yeah, his best friend with the girl, and the they fall in love. The mobster, if if the if the Don or the Capo tells you to watch over his girlfriend or wife, mm-hmm. you're in trouble. The old Pulp Fiction story. It's almost like the Potiphar. Remember Joseph and Potiphar it type was story. That, oh my gosh, that old movie with the blonde girl and the hotel owner. It was a black and white. Do you remember that was? You mean one of the film noir movies we did? <sighs> Greta Garbo. No. So that was like the, one of the first of those type where the boss hires the guy to look after her, and they end up together. Is it a movie we did? Yeah, no, we just watched it with your mom. It was one of those black and white old movies. It was a girl's name, maybe. Maybe somebody in the chat will know. I don't know. Anyways, so yeah, that old chestnut, and she's always like, can't leave him because you don't know him like I do, right? He's (laughs) he's a psycho, and the guy's like, come with me, and we can get together, and she never wants to leave the boss because for whatever reason, she has her loyalty. Yeah, I mean, all all of these elements just, I thought were... Kind of trite. They yeah. weren't very interesting. Well, she was getting her own nightclub, is what she remember. She wanted her own. Mm-hmm. Although I would add to uh, one of the curious figures that relates to the Manson stuff. Roy Raiden. Roy Raiden is one of the guys who wanted to produce and fund the Cotton Club. So there is some oh, yeah. there is some bizarre connections just to the making of this movie itself. Yeah. Uh, which comes up in Dave McGowan's book. So, let's see. Oni wants Dixie to work for him in Hollywood, right? Roy Raiden was an American show business producer who packaged vaudeville shows and oldies uh, and nostalgia tours in the '70s and '80s. He was probably best known for his attempt to finance the movie The Cotton Club and the subsequent victim of a murder for hire contract killing at age 33. So that's because uh, he was connected to organized crime and all that stuff in the Manson craziness. That's why I got Dave's book out, but because I wanted to find the Roy Raiden section. Go ahead. Um, their their slap dance. They had a, one of those scenes where they do the tango and they beat each other up because sexual mm-hmm, tension. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Remember that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. They use the N-word a lot in this movie, which I thought was weird. Um, well, it's preparing that time that time period. Yeah. Let's see. Here it is, page 208. Let's see. You keep going. I'm going to see what Dave says. Okay. I'm not saying this stuff. Okay. This is... Then they're going into the Great Depression. Nick's... Oh, okay. So one of the plots in the movie was Nick Cage's Dixie's brother mm-hmm. who also works for the boss 
the mob boss, right? Well, they're wannabes, yeah. And they don't even know the other the the other one works for them. Right. So Nick Cage has been doing his crime all this time. Oh, this is one. Oh, this is interesting. So this is why this is how the Roy Raiden thing connects to Laurel Canyon. I remember it now. So Dave talks about how Mama Cass from the Mamas and the Papas, right, um, who was very important, obviously, in the Laurel Canyon scene. Uh, the power power couple's circle of friends include Warren Beatty. So Warren Beatty is in Bugsy, right? Peter and Jane Fonda, Jack Nicholson, Terry Melker. Um, Girlfriend, Candace Bergen, Marlon Brando, Roman Polanski, Sharon Tate, Abigail Folger, Wojtek Frykowski, and the soon-to-be-dead gossip columnist Steve Brandt, Larry Hagman, presidential brother-in-law Peter Lawford, Marilyn Monroe, Dennis Hopper, Ryan O'Neill, Mia, Mia Farrow, um, Freemason Peter Sellers, Zsa Zsa Gabor, and the, <laughs> you may have heard of, Charles Manson, right, in the circles of mama Cass. interesting so the way that this relates to roy raiden is, is as follows uh there were to be sure numerous ties between the mamas and the papas and manson between the mamas and the papas and the chalo drive victims john phillips for example had invested ten thousand dollars in jay sebring's business venture sebring international which is rumored to have been a front for illegal activities including drug trafficking michelle phillips had a brief affair with roman polanski in london while polanski was married to soon to be murdered Sharon Tate during that same so sojourn to London Tate was reportedly uh, initiated into witchcraft um, and that's I just read another source to confirm that uh, Mama Cass has as also previously noted just li lived across the street from the house at 2774 Woodstock Road before occupied by Folger and Frykowski Abigail Folger being one of the victims for the Manson stuff. Uh, regulars at Cass's home included Pick Dawson, also a regular at the Frakowski Folger home, and at the Tate Polanski home. The son of a U.S. State Department official, who, according to John Phillips, was a suspect was suspected by the authorities of using diplomatic pouches to move drugs between countries. Uh, also present in these circles was Billy Doyle, local drug dealer, who uh, Dennis Hopper claimed was filmed while being flogged at the Tate Polanski house just three days before the murders. So in other words, BDSM type stuff going on. Another regular of these circles was Bill Mentzer, who was later convicted of the murder of Cotton Club producer Roy Radin. The LAPD once described Mentzer as a member of some kind of hit squad contract killers. And then... Uh, Dave goes on to mention Maury Terry's famous book, Ultimate Evil. So this is how we're, one thing that we'll notice when we get to the serial killer uh, series that I'll be doing next is how often this ties into uh, Manson stuff and the mafia stuff and the criminal networks. So you're going to find a, a consistent pattern of contract killing type stuff going on. So the producer of Cotton Club is directly connected to the Manson circles. You see the point here? Mm -hmm. And Laurel Canyon. It gets really weird. Is that all for this? Are we done with this? Um, well, you've got Nick died in a cage. That scene. <laughs> um, Irony. And then that song, Minnie the Moocher, they always play that. I wish I could remember how it goes, but it was like the Uptown Funk of 1931 or something. Gotcha. But, oh. oh, it's uh, Cab Calloway. The Cab Calloway song. How does it go? Howdy, 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 howdy. Yes. That guy. Right. Um. I don't even know. It's weird stuff. Remember the um, re remember the re the brief resurgence of that and then the I'm the scat man. Yeah. Be ba 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 da po. Came back ba 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 da po. A couple. I'm talking about the scat man. Yeah. The brief was that early 2000s or 90s, late 90s. Oh yeah. Skibi dibi dibi dum da da do. I'm the scat man. Terrible one hit wonder. Um. So oh, remember Lou Vega? A little bit of Tina in my life. A little bit of Jessica on my side. A little bit of the I need. need. Yeah. Yeah, that's a terrible song. I hate it. But Lucky Luciano visited the Cotton Club, so did Charlie Chaplin. Well, Lucky is who shows up in the movie to give the orders to get rid of Dutch Schultz because he's a problem. Uh, and Lucky, oh. Lucky is who organized the mafia 
into the structure that it is. Lawrence Fishburne gives an angry swirly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. He's um, one of the black gangsters, right, who... One of the yeah. songs, If You Want My Meat. It was the WAP of the 1930s. Yeah, yeah you're right about that. Yeah. Oh, they had this scene where they killed the Senator Thomas Dewey. Dewey was, of course, right, the one that Dutch Schultz wanted to have killed because Dewey was prosecuting the mafia. If you listen to my talks, we covered that. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Then Dixie is in the movie called Mob Boss. Right, but Dixie is playing George Raft. Yeah. The actor, yeah. Yeah. Who was in mob movies. So, and then... It was so dumb. The tap dancer guy kicked the gun out of the window at the climax. That was, was really dumb. Stupid. There was way too much tap dancing. I'm sorry. I liked Told the music, you. but <laughs> but I could have done with like a third less of the tap dancing. Mm -hmm. For sure. Hidey, 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 hidey. Yeah, hidey, hidey, hidey. Is that it? Yep. What was that called? Cotton Club. Cotton Club. So, Nick Cage. What did you think of Cotton Club? Um, it was fun. It was but not that fun great. Fun yeah. thing. Entertaining. Okay, so out of uh, Scarface, Untouchables, Cotton Club, and Bugsy, which what do you like so far? The best, I guess, Scarface. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. What about so? Movie. And and I know we're gonna do. But you didn't say this one yet. I know. So okay. uh, now, separate question mm -hmm. um, between Casino, Goodfellas, and Departed. Uh, what's your favorite Martin Scorsese that we're doing? I liked the story of Departed the best. I don't. I just liked it. Um, I was like Leo. Departed. Right. Bastard Matt Damon gets on my nerves. How do they laugh? Ha ha ha. That's the Boston laugh. <laughs> the Boston laugh. Ha ha ha. You retarded. Ha ha ha. Boston. Matt Damon. Ba. Ba. Everybody in Boston has a sheep voice. Ba. Mm-hmm. He's... Where's the... Oh, we're not talking about... Yeah, I, 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 I have to say... He's Rat uh, Damon in that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good point. Um, yeah, reviewing Casino is way better than I remembered it being. I remember in the 90s, I thought... I remember going to see it in the theater. I thought, that's kind of boring. Uh, now that I know about, you know, the mafia and all this geopolitics I actually like Casino better than uh, Departed and mm -hmm. somebody said the other day that Jack Nicholson performance was cringeworthy in Departed <laughs> he did I don't know maybe he was drunk in oh the, I don't that's know. the one thing that was the weakest link in that movie I think I thought he was just calling it in he didn't really ever scare me like when you're dealing with a guy with that much supposed power you want to feel like he's going to kill you at any second and he didn't really bring that I almost like Casino better than Goodfellas I know that people will disagree with that because Goodfellas is supposed to be the best Best mafia movie. I don't know, it's not better than Godfather, but uh, uh, I don't know. I just every time I see Casino, I notice things that I never noticed. I, I feel like it's a better film. It's it's underrated, uh, especially given like at the time, and you know, it's kind of like Scarface. I think people will look back and, and they'll have a better appreciation of, of Casino. Because when I think of the mafia, I don't or the 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 whole story of all this. I don't really think of the '30s. I don't think of the '40s and the noir era, uh, I mean, I know that's part of the story. I don't think of Al Capone. I think of Las Vegas. Right? I think of Casino. That's what I think of. Sinatra. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Vegas, exactly. That era. Okay. So this <coughs> is based on a true story. Again, Martin Scorsese Casino. Yeah, he's playing Mo. <coughs> Mo, I forget the guy's name. Mo, who's one of the point men in Las Vegas for the families. Yeah, this is based on a book by Nicholas Pileggi. And it's about the manager of the Tangiers Casino, a Jewish guy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Joe Pesci, again. He the, the two guys that are always in mob movies, Al Pacino, Joe Pesci, Robert and Robert De Niro. De Niro. Sure. Um, so Joe Pesci is like condensed mobster. Because he's so... He's, Mo Dallitz. He's like, I was thinking to say Mo Dites, but it's Mo Dallitz is the character that yeah. uh, Robert De Niro is playing. He, he's like essential oil of mobster. He's... That's, he probably is a mobster. I don't know. I don't know if he is. I mean, I was probably CIA. That's a better. Yeah. But he plays Nikki. So a lot of these A-listers are like CIA recruits, right? Mm -hmm. We know that with Ben Affleck with Jennifer Garner, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So. 
so opening scene there's all these shots of the desert and he's talking about how all the bodies buried in the desert so you could never find it's a perfect place for crime basically because it's just good this, point like at the center of the bodies electricity out in the and running water and right. then surrounded by nothing whatsoever. And that's what that was Bugsy's idea, right? Mm-hmm. Was to set this all up. Yeah. So Las Vegas is designed to take your money, duh. That's pretty much everyone knows that. They but they make yeah, a point but he of point, the you he that. yeah the 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 narrator character uh, uh, Mark Mark Scorsese likes narrators in his movies and the narrator character is Mo uh, towards the end of his life recounting the story. And talking about how, uh, you know, all the saps and the suckers coming every year, <laughs> dropping billions of dollars directly into our pockets. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, the Tangiers was real. Um, the If you watch Michael Francisi's videos, the famous guy on YouTube now who is the ex-mobster guy, um, when he reviews movies and clips, he's, he says that the Joe Pesci character in this is one of the most realistic portrayals of a wise guy that he's ever seen. Mm-hmm. So. so, the counting room guys always steal. And there's a big problem, but they, there's nothing they can do about it. Mm-hmm. Right? So, Vegas is for thieves <laughs> and gamblers and mobsters. And entertainment, right? I mean, everybody knows Vegas is about entertainment, right? And um, poor, poor women that are, they're always strung out in Vegas, right? <laughs> like, is, are there any women in Las Vegas? That aren't that... on drugs. <laughs> every dancer, right? <laughs> oh, poor lady. All the dancers. Um, but the money goes to Kansas City because that's a big hub, right? Mm-hmm. Which, uh, surely everybody knows that. Probably. So the, the mob bosses take their suitcase of money every so often. And they get on a little plane and fly mm-hmm. to a, a little deli in Kansas City. And they control the Teamsters Union. Yeah, now this is one of the uh, first places where I encounter. Now, if I had read you know some books on the mafia, this is one of the things you learn right away. In, for example, the Selwyn Rob book, he brings it up pretty quickly, but... Uh, Scorsese had put this in the film too right right away was that uh, they were controlling the union and they were going to put again people's pensions into the casinos uh, which is what we saw with with Bugsy right from the from the very Mm -hmm. get-go but they also control uh, politicians right buy them off and um, the irony here is that uh, everybody's just looking for a way to go after other people so the problem with Mo is that he doesn't get this goofy license, right? Mm-hmm. And then you've got Sharon Stone is a pickpocket chip stealer. And if anybody could make Michelle Pfeiffer look ladylike and Scarface is Sharon Stone because she was uh, bad luck. Right? The poor uh, mafia wives are always portrayed as just these strung out, strung out thoughts. Like they're just crazy. Well, how stressful would it be? To be in that position. Well, you chose. It's not like you know I forced you to marry that guy. That's true. But she's his type because she brings in high rollers. Well, the difference though is that here, uh, Mo is not actually a mobster. He's a connected person because mm-hmm. he's the Jewish guy. Right. But he he's keeps middle. thinking he's going to change her. Remember, that's his mistake. Yeah. I always thought, you know, like a business deal that, uh, you know. She would uh, eventually realize that uh, she loved me because it just made sense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it doesn't work that way, right? So then you've got Joe Pesci who wants in on De Niro's outfit in Vegas because at that time there wasn't that many East Coast guys out there, right? Yeah. So Joe Pesci, uh, who is the actual made man right shows up and they're buddies and they grew up together and he wants to help him run things right and this is the source of the problem because both of them make mistakes in running this place which lead to not only its downfall but the downfall of quite a few people um i like the way they deal with the hustlers the cheating teams that mm -hmm. sneak in they zap them with the cattle prod that that part was funny yeah. yeah So, but by the way, I had never gone to well, at one time in the uh, late, not really, the early 2000s, I went to a local casino about two hours away and it was such a shock that I was like, I'll never go to a casino again because it was just <laughs> garbage. It's like this floating barge of 
decrepit boomers pulling their oxygen tanks. I was like, this is not at all what I expected from the movies, right? I expect, you know, glitter and glamour and like... You thought it was going to be like Monaco. Guys in suits and it's like grandmas with... You wanted James Bond. Oxygen tanks, right? Exactly. And you got gold and And you got... I I got Blanche. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, so, but then Jamie and I got the idea when we were traveling back from Texas, uh, we passed through Hot Springs and we did the Mafia tour and they had just built this giant racetrack casino. Uh, so it was all brand new, and I was like, well, why don't we just go in there and see what that's like? Because I've never been in one, and I'd never done the roulette. I didn't care about anything else. Uh, so we did have fun spinning the roulette about 10 times. I think we were down $100, and then we made $200, and then we were down $50. So we didn't gamble a lot. It was just one time to do it to see what it was like. And I've always wanted to play the roulette, but the roulette wasn't even a roulette. It was like it's a weird now, screen like, roulette where you touch the screen. It was like... Poof rules and it was more like a video game. Yeah, it was like walking in and playing video games with adults in a giant video game arcade. Yeah. I was like, this is, it's not (laughs) what I thought. Well, that's what. (laughs) This is not cool at all. I was writing about that or I said something about. And it's all these people in there like drunk, like. Chuck E. Cheese. Like tipped up, like half falling over, like putting yeah. the quarter in the thing over and over and over. And it's just like, Chuck E. Cheese is Vegas for kids. It's the <laughs> exactly. same same machine, same characters, same everything. It looks not glamorous at all. It's, yeah. it's trashy, dude. So, yeah, I think video arcades are just like a training for to get people to go to casino. We would have been up $200 if I had... I mean, I was doing pretty. I, I was doing pretty gambling. good on roulette. I was doing pretty good. I gambling makes me sweat, and I get upset, and I get mad. I did pretty good on roulette, though, didn't and I? You did good. Yeah. You're lucky, but I hate roulette. So. Um, it wasn't even real roulette, though. It was like fake roulette. So you can't t- take a hooker and make her a housewife, babe. Eh? I don't know why Mo didn't learn this lesson, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, like you would have think he would being in Las Vegas, he would think he would know this, but. He thinks he's going to turn Sharon Stone into a good girl? He thinks if he gives her enough stability that she'll change. Uh, But I gave you, and jewels, right? Yeah. Just like drawer after drawer of giant jewels. his emergency money that only she can access that he needs to get him out of a jam. Like, he trusts his entire... She's Sharon Stone for most of this movie. Yeah. She's out of it. Oh, and she still loves some dude, some hanger on. James Woods. Yeah. So James Woods plays the sleazy... Uh, drug lord guy that she formerly dated and still loves. Yeah, but he won't do anything for her, or marry her, or anything. So she, she has a t- yeah, a, right, a pattern of this codependent mm-hmm. sort of loving the guys who treat her like crap, yeah. and then she can't stand, uh, you know, Robert De Niro who treats her well. Mm-hmm. So he gives her all the jewels and fur. Let's see, Nikki is made and Ace is not. So Nikki Joe Pesci. Well, this is the source of the problem yeah. because, right? I mean, Joe the the Mo character can't do anything and can't deal with the antics of of Nikki, mm-hmm. and it's causing problems. Mm-hmm. But Ace has the really good instincts about how to run the casino, so he's doing really superb at Mo. Um, no, not Mo. Ace De Niro. His name is Mo. Oh, Dallas. They call him Ace. Yeah. Okay. Um, to bring the bookie joints inside the casino. And so he's like climbing in the ranks of popularity in Vegas. But then Nikki, on the other hand, gets blackballed at every casino because he's a crazy gangster. Well, he's psycho, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then. But then uh, uh, Mo makes a mistake by trying to have a TV show. Right, remember he. Well, chose... that was after. Right. So Nikki brings his gang to Vegas for heist. So they start knocking off all of this people, making enemies. Um, mm-hmm. But he wants to put his money in legitimate places like restaurants, and then Nikki c- takes care of mob stuff in Vegas. Uh, let's see. And he's like the new boss of Vegas, basically. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. More or less. And yeah. then. She gets caught giving money to James Woods, and Robert Nero has to pistol whip a dude, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? And does so he? I forget. It, yeah, so it causes Sharon Stone to like lose it even more because 
he That's right. beat up her boyfriend. So well, she... he keeps having these these problems with his wife, and, mm-hmm. and this is leading to problems at the casino, and this is problems with Nikki, and so he's having a hard time running all this because of these out of control people in his in all of his circles, his orbit. And he fires a guy who he should not have. He should have made made up with them because mm-hmm. it was like the Las Vegas gaming license yeah, people. Yeah, and that was the whole thing that they had over him the whole time was that he was lacking this license. Yeah. In the meantime, Sharon Stone's making friends with Joe Pesci, which is pretty much the worst idea of all time. And they have a fling. And uh, they're just a bunch of thieves, thieving thieves out there, basically. It's like what this movie is saying, right? They're trying to stop the skimming. Um, there was a lawsuit and a murder put attention on Ace's casino. Yeah. And he's right. getting all this bad reputation because of Nikki. Mm-hmm. And Nikki and Ace argue about who will one run Vegas. Right. Because Nikki's getting more powerful too. And he thinks that the way to run this, right, is to, to do it like, you know, have a TV show, bring all these people in, bring get the media attention. And the bosses don't like that because, as we will see as a running theme, is mm-hmm. that media attention becomes one of the key, chief boons for he, the mafia. He does that because his license got denied, so he kind of loses it. So he can't be in charge anymore. He's going to have this TV show and mm-hmm. get the word out. It's a out. Johnny Carson-style TV yeah. show. Let's see. And then Sharon Stone, again, the crazy, is coming out. Uh, she wants... Sharon Stoned. <laughs> yes. She wants to leave Robert De Niro to be with James Woods, but he's even more of a sleazebag when he has some scenes with her and their kid. Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. He's even worse. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> she's like, I she can't stay here. I can't go issues. there. Yeah. Right. She got some excuse. Mm-hmm. So then when she tries to leave on her own with all the money, she gets caught by the cops. Right. And this leads to a big raid and yeah. a bunch of problems, right? Yeah. Oh, and she was even more crazy because she, like, tied her kid to the bed. Mm -hmm. So she was really out of... Abusive. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and uh, get to the conclusion here. Yeah, um, let's see, so... So what was the FBI raid over? (sighs) I forgot how they... Oh, they they went after because you didn't have that license, right? Some guy had a rant in his store... And they had bugged him a long time ago. That's right. And he's like, oh, no, the, Vegas, Vegas, Vegas. The deli. Yeah. One of the, boss, one of the bosses at the deli was just rambling on about mm-hmm. the whole operation. And the FBI raids the deli. And they arrest all the bosses, but they're too old for jail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, lots sense, of people getting whacked off. Yeah. Right. Um, Nikki was killed with bats and his brother. Right. This doesn't go well for the Joe Pesci, right? So, he, yeah. he caused so much of a ruckus and so much trouble that uh yeah he ends up out oft yes um corporations took over like mgm yeah so the, then the big mobsters come in built new casinos with junk bonds which i didn't know right so this relates to that uh probably that 80s uh junk bond scandal right which um is fascinating to look it's it's a whole own scam world of wall street stuff but yeah so the, the now we're going to get the real mobsters coming in right the the Fortune 100, Fortune 500, Wall, Wall Street. Street. That's the real gangsters, the real monsters. All right, uh, that was great. I loved it. Uh, th- this was fun. It, it tied in so well with, especially now that I know a lot of the history, um, when I'm watching the films, it's it's a, a much better experience. And you'll notice a lot of the mob films are just kind of um, conglomerations of the real people and the real stories. So... Um, it comes alive, right? <laughs> when you know the history as well as watching the film. So, uh, really, really like Casino a lot. That's my favorite of those. Well, I'll put Casino and Scarface on equal footing. And then in part two, Jamie and I, if you want the full experience, we will cover Goodfellas, The Departed, Donnie Brasco, and uh, one more, maybe Black Mass, which Black Mass was a really good portrayal of um, uh, Whitey Bulger and the. The Robert, or the, the the departed Jack Nicholson character is supposed to be Whitey Bulger, but it's uh, it's not very good. The John the Johnny Depp Black Mass portrayal of Whitey Bulger is much better, uh, just as Whitey Bulger goes. So um, that will be, of course, Irish Mafia, Winter Hill Gang, and their connection to being 
run and controlled by the FBI. Uh, so fascinating story there. That will be in part two. Uh, look for that in the next day or two. And then look for the next installment of the Mafia History Lecture in the next day or two. So if you want to, please support us with Super Chats. Thank everybody for joining us tonight. Daniel Ania sends $10 and he says, great stream. Thank you, Daniel. Much appreciated. Hope you guys enjoy and are learning things, right? This is premier infotainment right here, baby. Aiden Buck, $20. Great stream, guys. I'm loving the Mafia analysis. Have you watched the HBO series Boardwalk Empire? I have not. Now, I know a lot of people have said you got to watch Boardwalk Empire. Um, it will be in our list. I've not seen every mob movie. <laughs> There's still some I haven't seen. Um, that is one of the series that I've not yet seen, but uh, a lot of people have recommended it. It is something of a uh, Sopranos prequel examining the origins of the Atlantic City Mafia set during Prohibition. Very much worth checking out if you haven't seen it. Yeah, I hear it's really good. We'll definitely check it out. Uh, Marius, the big dum dum, twenty bucks. I have been recommending Jay's videos so much, people think that I'm in a cult now. <laughs> I need to diversify, or do I? Well, uh, we'll have T-shirts soon. Yeah, so, then so the Jamie's going to recognize each other. Jamie's going to get us some uh, T-shirts. So now the cult will have their own attire mm -hmm. that everybody can wear the same cult All attire. All cults start with T-shirts. <laughs> uh, Stinky Linky, five dollars. Dance to some Cole Porter and think of how you'll be as rich as the mafia when crypto goes to the moon. Hey. Mm -hmm. Baby, Bitcoin already is on its way to the moon. And again, what well, I'm expecting 100K by December. So uh, everybody be sure and hodl. Don't get nervous. Bitcoin has uh, 10 to 20% corrections every time it pumps. It's normal. Don't worry about it. Don't freak out. Don't have paper hands. Have those diamond hands when it comes to the coin. Um, beware of the alts. You can still make money on alts, but it's risky. Right, that's a real casino, <laughs> the altcoin <laughs> casino. Right, yeah. so you can do okay with alts. I'm not gonna try to tell you, give you alt advice, but uh, safest bet is definitely long term BTC, baby. Uh, anything else? Subscribe, hit like and share. And uh, part two again will be in the next couple of days. It'll be fun. Donnie Brasco, what is it? Departed, Departed, Goodfellas, classic. And 